listening therapy and to help uh, those of you uh, attending to understand how it can be helpful for people with an autism spectrum disorder. Now this method is used um, from a real rehabilitative standpoint to helping people maintain their health and wellness to achieving peak performance in their life. But our focus, since we're doing this with the Akil Autism Foundation, is to focus on how it relates um, for children primarily with uh, autism spectrum disorders. So uh, first of all, a little bit about our company. Advanced Brain Technologies was founded in 1998. We are a neurotechnology company, which means that we develop programs that help enhance brain performance. Um, effective, non-invasive programs that help us to get more from our brain, to have a better brain by engaging the brain's natural plasticity or the natural ability for the brain to uh, change itself. Since our topic today is the listening program, um, I think it's important that we first of all discuss what sound is, because music is an art form uh, of sound. So sound is everywhere. It's ubiquitous uh, with our life. Uh, it, it's something that we all engage with, that we communicate with, that we listen to. And sounds are created when objects vibrate. Now, so sounds can be harmful. Um, but sounds can also be very healing and very helpful in our life. And we're going to focus on the helpful healing aspects of sound. Uh, and when I say that sounds can be harmful, that means that certain sounds, uh, when we're exposed to them too loudly, uh, can actually damage the very delicate structures in our ear. So safe uh, sound levels are sounds that are below 75 decibels. Uh, those would be considered safe, and any sounds above that level could be potentially harmful uh, to our hearing. So the listening program, uh, which we're speaking to, is uh, based in a field of study called psychoacoustics, which is the psychological study of the human perception of sound. And we know that the way that we perceive sound is made up of four primary um, attributes, which are frequency information, um, amplitude, time, as well as space. And I'm just going to take a few minutes to speak about each, just to give a good foundation so that we understand how hearing works. So sound is determined by the frequency of vibration, or how often the vibration repeats itself uh, within one second's time. And the more vibrations that occur within a second, the higher the frequency. So the measurement that's used is called hertz. So a vibration at 20 uh, cycles per second would be 20 hertz, which would be a very low sound. And 20,000 cycles per second would be 20,000 hertz, which would be a very high sound. And 20 to 20,000 hertz happens to be the range of human hearing. Now when we perceive the frequency of sound, that's what we call pitch. And we hear pitches from musical instruments, and we also hear pitches from the human voice. So different instruments have different sound frequencies, just as each of us, as we speak, have different sound frequencies. So that's, that's essentially the frequency aspect of auditory perception. We also have amplitude uh, perception. And amplitude is our, perce our perception of loudness, and loudness is measured in decibels. The louder the sound, the higher the decibel level will be, and the softer, the lower the decibel level would, will be. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, sounds lower than 75 decibels are considered safe. Um, exposure of sounds of 85 decibels or higher over time can actually damage uh, the, the ear permanently. And sounds above 110 decibels can uh, cause permanent damage. So we might be thinking, you know, what, what are these levels? Well, typical conversation when we're speaking to somebody in a room is around 50 to 65 decibels approximately. Um, when you're hearing a sound at 110 decibels, that would be something like a gunshot. Uh, going off. Um, but even being in a movie theater, at least here in the U.S., 
Uh, the sounds are over 85 decibels and sometimes closer to 100. So some of the common environments that we're in can actually be doing uh, harm to uh, the delicate structures of our ears. So um, you know, one of the first steps to a healthy auditory system, um, which is you know, vital for communication, is to uh, keep our children in safer sound environments. And at any time they're listening to music, for example, uh, that they listen at very comfortable levels that aren't too loud. And when in loud environments, um, foam or wax earplugs can actually lower uh, the loudness levels by up to 29 decibels. And they're very inexpensive and something that we recommend to uh, help children when they're in loud environments, uh, as well as their parents. Now, time is also an element of auditory perception because sound is an event that occurs in time. And there is a field of study called chronobiology, uh, which examines the biological rhythm of time and helps us understand how uh, our body rhythms affect us as we move throughout our day. Now, uh, within music, we know that tempo uh, is the pacing of the music. So that's one of the timing elements uh, within sound. Uh, so that's an important concept to understand, as is entrainment, which is the synchronization of body rhythms. And part of what we'll speak about with the listening program is that it works on a principle of entrainment by using the rhythm and the timing in the music to help entrain and improve um, not only the body rhythms, but the rhythms in the brain to uh, help it to be uh, organized and work with better uh, synchrony. Um, and now we think of timing. Timing is also important for language. Um, so when we speak, the timing and the rhythm of our speech gives us information about what's being said. And one example that a speech therapist uh, that we work with shared with me was the phrase, I want another mother. So if I say, I want another mother versus I want another mother. When I change my tone and when I change my timing, it changes the meaning from wanting a different mother to wanting something else mother. So the ability for the brain to understand timing is very essential to our understanding of language. Now space is the fourth and a very crucial component of auditory perception um, because sound does happen in the space around us. And it's critical for us to be able to localize and understand where sound is coming from. Uh, it's critical to our basic survival. Now the brain is able to localize sound even though we can't see it. The brain knows where sound is coming from uh, if we have two ears that are functioning and working well. And it does that by measuring the time difference between sounds arriving to our ears and the volume difference between the sounds arriving to our ears. And the pinna, which is that external portion of the ear that we see that we generally call the ear, is important in that process because it acts like a radar dish or a satellite dish that is collecting the sound information in our environment and then channeling it into our audit auditory system in our brain so that we can hear it. Um, and we know it is critical that we understand the sound around us to know if we're safe or not. Uh, and to localize space, the frequency, volume, and timing perception of the auditory system must be working well. So to recap, to perceive sound, we must accurately perceive frequency of sound, volume, time, as well as the spatial information to know where sound is in fact coming from. Now, now that we have some understanding of what sound is, let's take a look at the ear. Uh, the ear is divided into three divisions. There is the outer ear, which consists of the pinna, the ear canal, and the tympanic membrane. The middle ear, which is made up of the ossicles, which are the bones, muscles, and the eustachian tube. Then the inner ear is the cochlea and the vestibular system. And we're going to look at each of these in a little more detail. The outer ear, uh, we generally think of as this portion here, which we call the ear. This is the pinna. And then there is an ear canal. And here we see the eardrum, the tympanic membrane. Sound vibration comes from our world, is collected by the pinna, 
and channels down the ear canal where it reaches this tympanic membrane, which responds uh, to this vibration of sound. Then that sound travels through these bones. These are called the ossicles, named the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Um, or a common, commonly described is the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So the vibrations can move through these three tiny bones. Uh, there's an air-filled chamber here in the eustachian tube. Uh, then what you see here is the vestibular and the cochlear system within the inner ear. So the middle ear has a very specific job. Uh, what it's designed to do is two things. It essentially works like a gate. It amplifies soft sounds of speech or increases their volume so it's easier for the brain to discriminate what people are saying. And then it also blocks or dampens or lowers the volume on very intense sound that can damage the delicate hairs that are within the cochlea. So as we think of the middle ear, it's designed to keep us safe from sound, but also to improve our communication by amplifying sound, depending what that sound is. Now, there are two muscles that control these bones, which are called the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscles. These are the smallest muscles in our body, and they're what regulate this system. Now, if these middle ear muscles are not functioning properly, the nervous system can become bombarded with unwanted sound. Uh, we don't have earlets, so there's no protection from that assault of information. Uh, children who experience auditory sensitivities might be unable to modulate the sensations received in the middle ear and may experience the autonomic nervous system state of fight or flight or that survival response. And they may appear hypervigilant. When they can't escape or flee from that sound, um, or from a seemingly threatening sensory experience, they might act out defensively in that fight state. And in extreme cases, a child may withdraw and completely shut down. And we'll see behaviors such as covering the ears, aggression, rocking, humming, and self-stimulation. The child might show a lack of facial expression, make poor eye contact, or show little interest in others, and have actually a flat in uh, monotonal voice that's devoid of rhythm. So this middle ear is actually uh, very important to us. Um, and it's part of what's called our social engagement system. And this system is related to stress reactivity, uh, sensitivity of social engagement behavior, um, leads to lower levels of physiological and safety needs. So lower levels are needed, including physiological and safety, that are prioritized before higher levels such as love, belonging, self-esteem, and self-actualization. So the social engagement system is you know, working on low levels and high levels, but when it's focused on the low levels, the higher levels aren't taking place. So if we're in a survival mode, um, we can't express or experience love, belonging, intimacy. We'll have less confidence, uh, difficulties learning and problem solving, and showing empathy and acceptance of others. Uh, some of the very qualities that make us dist distinctively human are impaired when the social engagement is turned off. So the middle ear is you know, one of the keys to the social engagement system. Now, something also important to look at with the middle ear is middle ear fluid. Um, many, many children are prone to uh, ear infections or ear, ear fluid, uh, which uh, happens in this area right here, which hopefully you're able to see. And that fluid puts pressure on the eardrum, which causes a redness or pain. And the fluid uh, happens when there are viruses and bacteria that enter the eustachian tube that come from the throat. And that tends to happen when there's uh, allergies or upper respiratory infections. So it's something that we really encourage parents to look at closely is to make sure their kids have good middle ear health. Um, the pediatrician can look down the auditory canal and see if the eardrum is red 
uh, which could give them some indication if there's an infection, um, but they cannot see if there is fluid behind that eardrum without a test called a tympanogram. And the tympanogram sends little puffs of air to the eardrum and measures the response of that to help detect if there is fluid in here. And if there is, in fact, fluid, uh, that may need to be treated um, with ear tubes, for example, which are inserted here in the eardrum, which then help regulate the fluid pressure level uh, within the system. Now, also, something important to look at in the middle ear is hypersensitivity to sound. And sound sensitivities are uh, not uncommon for kids with autism spectrum disorders where we behaviorally see that they are bothered by certain sounds, fearful of sounds, which would be phonophobia, uh, which is different than hypersensitivity, uh, or irritated by sound. And as we were talking about social engagement a bit earlier, uh, we understand that when we're hypersensitive to sound, our energy is devoted to blocking that sound out. And when that occurs, then we really can't communicate or engage with others. So if we're constantly bombarded by sound that we experience as painful or uncomfortable, it's very difficult to uh, interact. So um, you know, this is really critical for us to look at. And it's not as if a child is sensitive to all of the sounds in their environment but mainly sounds that uh, occur in certain situations at certain volume levels or with a certain context, uh, if you will. And the middle ear is very essential to helping to block and dampen these sounds uh, in order for a child to be comfortable uh, within their environment. Now this auditory system is actually rather complex, as we can see here from this diagram. Uh, we've talked about the outer ear and the role of the middle ear, and what we're seeing now is a diagram of the inner ear labyrinth. And this labyrinth contains the cochlea, which is a series of ducts filled with fluid in a membrane that has hair cells uh, that respond to sound frequency. Then there is also the vestibular system, uh, which also contains fluid-filled canals uh, that move in response to motion in the body, but also uh, in portions of it in the utricle and saccule are actually responsive to sound vibration that occurs in the body as well. So this is the system that converts the vibrational energy into electrochemical impulses that the brain then perceives to control what we hear, how we hear it, muscle movement within the body, uh, gravitational response, posture, balance, equilibrium, all of this happens in this little area that in actual size is only about the size of a small marble. Now within the cochlea portion of that labyrinth is something called the tonotopic map. And if we look at this cochlea in a, in a very simple diagram, we see that it's shaped like a snail with two and a half turns. And there are cells that are along the membrane in the cochlea that are tuned to certain frequencies of sound, just like keys on the piano. And on one end, we have very high frequencies at around 20,000 hertz that's connected to the middle ear. And then as we move through the cochlea, we go to lower sound frequencies as low as 20 hertz. So as vibration moves through this cochlea, hair cells are programmed, little cells, to respond with more excitement when the frequency matches that hair cell. So for example, uh, when I'm speaking, one of the frequencies you hear in my voice is a frequency of about 2,000 hertz, where you see here. So as I'm speaking and that frequency comes through my voice, the hair cells here fire more and get more excited. Then what they do is they send a signal on the auditory nerve, which goes to the brain. And there's a part of the brain, which we see right here in the left hemisphere, called the uh, primary auditory cortex. And in this primary auditory cortex, of which we have two, one on the left side, which takes most of its information from our right ear, and one on, on the right side, which takes most of the information from the left ear. 
and we can see that this is also arranged much like a piano keyboard with certain neurons cells that are programmed to respond to those cells in the cochlea. So when these cells at 2000 Hertz fire, then the cells at 2000 Hertz in the auditory cortex fire, then send a signal back for the ear to, to discriminate and better tune into what we're hearing. So this is called the tonotopic map. And then all the frequencies you know, in between are also filled in between the low and the high frequencies. Then the vestibular system, which we spoke to early, earlier, is not a hearing system, but actually a movement balance postural regulator that controls the movement of the muscles within our body, um, helps to coordinate the muscle movement in the eyes so that we can uh, have our vision fixed on an object even when that object is moving or we are moving. It gives us our ability to have balance, our sense of e equilibrium, but it uh, is also very critical to our proprioceptive system. Uh, which gives us information about where our body is in space. So one way to think about it is that the vestibular system is like the ear of our body and the cochlea being our hearing ear. Now, uh, I want to define a few things as we move along here. Um, hearing, listening, and auditory processing because the uh, three are each different from each other. Uh, and we attribute the definition of hearing versus listening to uh, the French ear, nose, and throat physician, Dr. Alfred Tomatis, who we'll speak about a bit uh, here in a few moments. But hearing is passive. It's the ability for the ear to simply sense that a sound exists or is present. Where listening is active, it's the ability to take in information and filter out sound information at the same time. And that middle ear is kind of the first part of that listening system that both blocks sound but also allows sound to come in. So a taking in and a filtering out, what we call a tuning and attenuating sound. And then auditory processing is a dynamic ability uh, and is most simply defined as what the brain does with what it hears. So that auditory processing dynamic part of the hearing listening system uh, is made up of different skills uh, called our skills of auditory processing. Now earlier we discussed frequency, amplitude, time, and space perception. These are the fundamentals of the auditory processing system. But in addition to those fundamentals, we also have the ability for the system to attend to auditory information, to discriminate and tell differences between sounds or words, and the ability to expect what sound is actually coming next, and the ability to fill in missing pieces of sounds or words. In addition, we have auditory figure ground, which is our ability to perceive speech even when there are competing sounds present, say um, being in a loud restaurant, having a conversation with somebody, we're attuning to the voices at the table and trying to attenuate or block out the competing sounds that are present. And that's called auditory figure ground. And that's a very common difficulty uh, that children have, especially uh, listening in the classroom. Auditory cohesion is the ability to understand the meaning, the meaning, the intention of what is being heard. So it's not the words that are spoken but it's the meaning and the intention in, in the voice or even within music that allows us to learn about and understand that individual that's communicating with us. Uh, auditory memory is the ability to sequence sounds, words, or other meaningful combinations of sound, uh, to receive them, to store them in the brain, to process them, and to recall and reuse them. And, um, I think one of the most important parts of auditory memory that we need to be considering for our kids is auditory working memory, which is what we receive, store, process, and use within just one minute's time, which is essential for all of our learning experiences. And we commonly see very low auditory working memory in children that needs to be, that needs to be addressed. And then the auditory system is also t just simply taking in all of the sound 
uh, in our environment and extracting what it needs even in a very large mixture of sound and that's called our auditory scene analysis. So when we look at our auditory processing skills, there are actually about a dozen skills that are involved with what the brain does with what it hears. So there's no wonder um, that we see so many challenges in auditory processing both in kids as well as adults. So how do we know if there's a difficulty? Um, many of the symptoms that we see here on, on your screen are symptoms that are common not just with auditory processing difficulties, uh, but also with uh, learning disabilities, um, people that have been diagnosed as being dyslexic, diagnosed as having attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or autism spectrum disorders. Um, the, there's difficulty blocking out background noise. Um, simply can't do it, so must leave the environment or avoid the environment when there's back, background noise that's pleasant, uh, present. Excuse me. Uh, there can be difficulty following conversations or understanding and following what's happening in a conversation. Uh, we see fidgety kids, um, very distractible, difficulty following directions, um, problems in their organization. Uh, their physical organization, coordination within their body, uh, as well as organization in their life. Um, they can look a bit disheveled uh, at times and their space and environment may also be disorganized as well as their ability to manage time in themselves. Um, we, as we spoke earlier, we see auditory working memory challenges, difficulties with language and speech, um, with the ability to read in academic performance or in the work case of adults with work performance, uh, with auditory processing difficulties and a lot of misunderstandings, that can make our relationships difficult uh, between spouses, uh, friends, siblings, and teachers. Um, along with these things, we commonly see very low self-confidence. Um, the children just don't feel great about themselves with all of these challenges. Uh, and we see the auditory hypersensitivities, uh, which we spoke about earlier. So the listening program, um, which we're now going to transition into discussing, is a music listening therapy method, which helps to improve the brain's ability to process auditory information, uh, both in the cochlear system as well as the vestibular system. Um, it is built on a foundation of uh, work that has been going on for more than 70 years now uh, that actually started in Denmark in the mid-1930s uh, with a gentleman named Wolf who uh, developed some shellac records that enhanced frequencies in electronic music that people would listen to. And then in the 50s, a uh, French ear, nose, and throat physician by the name of Alfred Tomatis who is really credited as the grandfather of the field of listening therapies, uh, started his work and created a, a method called the Tomatis method, which retrained the ear. So as the ear had deficits within it, that through a very specific program of listening to the music of Mozart and Gregorian chant, that was processed through a device called the electronic ear, which modified the frequency and volume and time information within the sound essentially would retrain the brain um, by experience the sound, experiencing the sound in a new way, uh, the way that it should to function properly. Uh, others followed in the footsteps of Tomatis, including Dr. Guy Berard, who developed uh, the Berard method of auditory integration training called AIT. Um, he first went to Dr. Tomatis as a patient uh, with hyper with hyperacusis and tinnitus uh, ringing within his ears and became so inspired by his experience and work uh, that he went on to develop his own method. And what's happened is over the course of uh, several decades, different offshoots of both Tomatis and Berard uh, have come about. And as new technology has developed, um, the field of neuroscience uh, has come into existence, which gives us a much greater understanding of how the brain processes sound information. Uh, the field has really, really evolved and in an exciting place uh, today. Um, 
the listening program has been part of that evolution and originally became available to families in 1999 uh, after our team uh, spent two years in development. And part of the inspiration for creating the listening program uh, was actually with the work I was doing with my father, uh, Robert Doman, at the National Association for Child Development. Uh, he had been um, referring children to Dr. Tomata since the mid-1970s to receive that method and then had later brought the Burrard method into NACD uh, in which I was trained in and began to do uh, clinical work with the NACD families and all of the other derivative methods of Tomatis uh, were clinically studied at NACD and as we uh, did this work um, we came to understand that there were new or different ways that the that the results of these programs could be achieved. Uh, we thought that the they could be made more affordable uh, and also felt that if these methods were done within the home um, over over the long term that we would see you know better long term outcomes with them. So this journey led us to develop a very safe effective and accessible program that was easy to use uh, that gave parents the ability to do it in the home, uh, teachers to do it in the classroom, adults to do it in their workplace, therapists to work within it, within the clinic or the hospital, uh, and you know even when riding in the car to and from school, uh, providing a lot of flexibility. So uh, a multidisciplinary team of therapists and sound engineers and musicians were actually brought together and uh, we developed uh, the earliest version of the listening program uh, and, as mentioned, started working with families in 1999. So the listening program is not the Tomatis method. It's quite different, but it does build on Tomatis's clinical work and ideas. And the areas of most influence of Tomatis are the practical capabilities of the ear. What, in fact, is the ear capable of doing? And also, Tomatis' discovery that you could improve auditory functions by training the ear with music listening therapy. Now, in Tomatis' work, he uh, identified different ranges of sound frequency that were associated to different functions and essentially performance uh, as people, uh, which we're going to talk to about in a minute. And also, Tomatis' discovery that the voice can only reproduce what the ear can hear, which is called the Tomatis effect. So if the ear can't hear auditory information, the voice won't express it. So the brain has to have the information in order to reproduce the information. So we can often see auditory problems in the way people communicate. Uh, so their speech and language is an indication of how well their auditory system is working. What I want to do is focus just a little bit on these Tomata zones. And what you're seeing on your screen now is a chart that we've developed to represent these zones. So we see a human figure here um, with very various colors. There's a blue outline around the figure. Then we see a green portion, an orange portion, and a red portion. Tomatis found in his clinical practice that when there were deficits in perception in different ranges of sound frequency, that we may see a correlation in the function and performance in different areas. So he divided, the, uh, divided us as people into three zones. Uh, zone one, which is called the body, zone two, which is communication, and zone three, which is creativity. So zone one we see is the largest zone, which is within green, and that's the zone of the body. And that body zone, if we recall back to earlier, that the vestibular portion of the ear is the body ear. So our balance, um, rhythm, and coordination, which is connected into the cerebellum, uh, within the brain, the control of muscle uh, coordination and tone, our sense of body awareness, proprioception, uh, direction would be in that zone one in the lower frequencies of sound below 750 hertz. So these are sounds, very low tone, low pitches. Uh, for example, um, a cello 
or a bass in an ensemble or a bassoon is where we're thinking of instruments. Then in zone two, this communication zone also relates to some of our executive uh, functions of memory and concentration and attention, but also is the range in which um, speech language communication occurs uh, in the primary frequencies and the control of our voice. And that's a range of about 500 to 4,000 hertz. Then the zone three, which uh, is the zone of creativity, is uh, energy. And Tomatis uh, called the ear the battery to the brain, so that high frequency sounds actually provide cortical charge to give the brain energy to function better. Uh, it's where our intuition, our sense of ideas and ideals, creativity uh, come into place, and that's in the higher level. So if we look at this from a neurodevelopmental perspective, the low frequencies occur in initially the, the lower brain centers, then going to the mid frequencies up, up to the high frequencies. And our ability to refine our discrimination also follows a developmental model of becoming physically efficient in our body first, uh, working to develop language and communication, then refining everything uh, as we mature. So how do we affect a change in these three Tomata zones? We can use music. Um, you know, music is an art form whose medium is sound, and it's made up of different sound frequencies. In fact, all of the sound frequencies the human ear can hear can be achieved with musical instruments. So by playing um, or listening to music, with specific frequency information, it's very possible to retrain the auditory system with practice and experience to process the sound the way it is intended to uh, if there is a deficit. Now music we know is complementary. It's something very enjoyable for all of us. Music in itself can improve our listening, our attention, and our ability to regulate ourselves we can listen to music to reduce stress and lower anxiety levels. Uh, neuroscience is now found, and there's a field of music neuroscience today that's showing that there is not a cognitive function that is not touched by music in some way. And the way that we get into the brain to use music to help improve its function is through these cochlear and vestibular systems in the ear. And by using music, um, Anything that we're doing in terms of a therapeutic and educational uh, intervention um, will help us to attain, attain our goals faster. So the way to think about the listening program is to add it to what you're currently doing to help your child and to look to achieve your goals and results faster by adding this in. Now the listening program is psychoacoustically modified music and it's recordings of classical music of the composers Mozart, Haydn, and Antonio Vivaldi uh, as well as some other composers but Mozart and Haydn and Vivaldi are primary. Uh, they're chosen, uh, Mozart and Haydn in particular, because they're very accessible, they're easy to listen to. Uh, they're not complex uh, in terms of the compositions of music that we're using. That music is used to help train the brain to improve its ability to understand frequency, volume, time, and space. The music is modified by using high-definition music recordings. All of the music for the listening program has been recorded um, by Advanced Brain Technologies uh, with our own chamber ensemble, which is named the Archangelus Chamber Ensemble. And the high-definition is the highest recording standard uh, that's obtainable, so it gives us the closest experience to live music we can have in recorded sound. Now that music is modified using different technologies um, and we'll just touch on three of them which are called filtration, audio bursting, and spatial surround. What filtration allows us to do is to remove and enhance certain sound frequencies that correspond with the tomato zones. So if we want to increase the awareness of zone one in the body, 
uh, we perform music with more low frequency sound and actually filter it to enhance the low frequencies by removing some of the high frequency sound information. If we want to enhance communication, uh, we, low, we remove some low as well as high frequencies. If for zone two, then for zone three, we remove lower and mid frequencies to focus on zone three, and that's a technology called filtration. Now, there's much more involved with how we filter the music, but I don't want to get into too many technical details. There's also a technology called audio bursting, which uh, is random, very rapid changes in volume within the sound. And that audio bursting is designed to engage that middle ear, which is part of our social engagement system, so that it can, in fact, block sound when it's supposed to and amplify sound when it's supposed to. So the audio bursts give that system the exercise or the practice to do that accurately. Then the uh, third major technology we use is spatial surround. Uh, which actually gives us the ability to do surround sound within the headphones that the program is heard within um, based on how we've recorded the music and then technology that we've incorporated into the production of it. So you experience it in 360 degree space just like our natural environment. So the idea with spatial surround is to replicate a natural sound environment so the training is more effective. Uh, in training our spatial awareness and sound discrimination. Now, this program, uh, the listening program, has a proprietary design called the ABC Modular Design that provides the appropriate training for social engagement by effectively exercising the auditory system. The, the training has three phases. There is an accommodation phase, which is a warm-up. There is a training phase called a workout in an integration phase, which is the cool down. Uh, it's similar to aerobic exercise, if you will. Uh, each 60-minute listening program album has four 15-minute modules. So the ABC design is a 15-minute module. And each module has these three phases of stimulation. The A phase, which is designed to relax the listener. Um, make their nervous system more available to receive the more intensive stimulation in the B phase. This is the phase in which the audio bursting stimulates and exercises the neural pathways that are involved with the listening and helps to simultaneously stimulate the function of the other aspects of the social engagement system. So this is training that gate within the middle ear. And then the listener is guided to a relaxed state in the C phase uh, which is the final phase where they integrate that experience. So these modules uh, integrate progressive entrainment processes. So the music starts at slower tempos, which go to moderate to faster to moderate to slow tempos at the end. The complexity of the music starts simple, gets a little more complex, then goes back to simpler um, orchestral structure, and then the psychoacoustic processes, such as the filtration, go from no filters to moderate to more intensive to moderate to uh, less and no, actually no filtration at the end. So uh, every time somebody listens to the listening program, we are gradually introducing them to the stimulation, uh, providing training, and then gradually moving away from it. And this is completely unique to the listening program. So, you know, interventions that are designed to improve spontaneous social engagement should ensure that the context of that um, gives someone a sense of safety. So the sense of safety is how the brain distinguishes whether situations are safe, dangerous, or life-threatening. And we want a safe, comfortable listening session with a positive context, using this ABC modular design helps the listener's brain have a sense of safety so that that middle ear is going to function better and be more responsive to the program. Uh, the listening program, as we've mentioned, is very flexible. It can essentially be done anywhere. Um, it complements a school program, a therapeutic or a behavioral intervention. Um, helps to enhance brain health and actually 
work on a peak performance level. And in fact, uh, we recommend that parents uh, listen with their children uh, so that the parents actually have an opportunity to benefit from this training to regulate their stress and anxiety in their life so they can be a better parent and be more available uh, in patient and um, understanding and knowing of their own child. Um, so we can use this for somebody that's quote-unquote neurotypical, meaning there are no uh, perceived medical or neurological problems, to actually working with people with severe brain injury. Um, infants can do the program as well as seniors. Uh, the program is 15 to 30 minutes a day, depending on the schedule that is designed for that listener, uh, done five days a week, taking two days off. Uh, a program will happen initially over the course of several months um, because the foundation of the program is a total of 50 hours of listening that is done over time. Then, depending on the listener and their goals and where they're at in their life, the program may be continued over time. So the listening program uh, level one, which is the primary system used today, is available in two musical formats. One is with Sounds of Nature, where actually the musical compositions have uh, natural sounds of birds and water that are incorporated within the music to give more spatial information and to generate more active listening or interest in the listening experience. And we find that about three, three out of four kids prefer listening with the nature sounds. But for those that don't, they can listen without sounds of nature, so we actually have the program available in two different formats. Now, the listening program is organized uh, across ten musical albums that are each one hour in length. Um, they are called Full Spectrum, Sensory Integration, Speech and Language, and High Spectrum. And the program is actually color-coded to this frequency zone chart. So we see that the blue around this human figure uh, is trained with the full spectrum music, which are the first two albums, which create an overall organizing experience as an introduction to the program. So we use those two albums for two to four weeks, depending on whether we're listening for 15 to 30 minutes a day. Uh, then we proceed to these green albums, which are sensory integration, which are training that body zone of zone one. Those are also used for two to four weeks. Then we progress to speech and language in the communication zone. These orange albums, number five and six, those are used for two to four weeks. Then we progress into zone three, high spectrum, in which there are four albums. And these four albums are used for four to eight weeks total. So we end up with a 10 to 20 week uh, initial program. And then once we've done that, we actually go back and repeat the uh, red zone again in high spectrum, go back to speech and communication, return to sensory integration, finishing with full spectrum. And that constitutes a full TLP protocol or two cycles of listening, which would be a total of 50 hours. Then if we need to refine the training more and we find that we need more attention in zone one or more attention in zone two, for example, then modifications can be made to the schedule for that listener based on what they're needing at that time. So the program is very easy. It's a color-coded system. It goes in a very specific sequential order. The schedule can be modified based on the scheduling of the family and how much listening uh, that listener is comfortable doing within a day. Uh, so it provides lots of flexibility. And just to see an example of the most common schedule, this is the base schedule, which takes 10 weeks to do a cycle. So two of those 15-minute modules are listened to per day, uh, generally one in the morning. Uh, before school or when someone wakes up, and one in the afternoon when they return from school or maybe before um, meal time uh, in the evening. And one album is used for a week, that's album one, then album two, and you can see we go from weeks one to ten, and then when we repeat a cycle we go back from ten to one, and there are actual, actual listening forms that the family follows along with their provider who's going to oversee their program to know exactly what you do every day. All of that's laid out and it's been made very simple so it's not difficult for a family to manage. 
the listening environment should be safe for that listener. Uh, they should feel comfortable in the place where they're doing their listening so they have a good sense of safety and security. We want to minimize distractions. Uh, have different listening activities available for them that are appropriate. And actually listening can be done in the car if there's not enough time to fit it in the family schedule otherwise. Uh, in terms of listening activities, there's a whole range of things. Uh, first of all, listening should always be enjoyable, nothing that's forced. Uh, the music's beautiful, uh, the listening sessions being just 15 minutes at a time, we don't need a lot of attention. The listener can simply relax, receive deep pressure, deep massage. They can engage in quiet activities like simple puzzles, um, Play-Doh, um, playing with clay, um, doing art of any kind at whatever level they can do. We can do activities to support fine motor, fine motor development. We can do movement-based activities that support visual and uh, vestibular integration, um, you know, things like brain gym or other neurodevelopmentally appropriate uh, activities or creative activities you know, like art as we spoke to. So uh, there are also activities we should avoid. Um, we really shouldn't listen uh, while watching television or playing a video game. Uh, ideally, we wouldn't listen during homework or reading or any, any activity that is logic-based. Uh, for safety reasons, someone wouldn't listen when they're driving or riding a bike, and ideally uh, not during eating, although some of our listeners, that's the only time you know, we're able to get the listening in, um, and then sleep also should not be the time we're doing the listening. Now, the uh, listening can be done uh, two ways. Um, we hear through two different pathways. Um, so there is, and two natural sound conduction pathways. There is the air conduction pathway, which is, you know, what we would experience through headphones themselves, right, through the ears here. Then there's the bone conduction pathway. And we actually perceive ourselves through bone conduction. Um, you know, you may want to try and exercise right now while you're listening and begin humming. Um, so, hmm. So I'd like you to hum and hum for a few seconds and then cover your ears and then continue your humming. Then take your hands off of your ears when you're finished humming. And what you're going to notice is a difference in how you hear your own voice or the sound of the humming. So just take a few moments to first of all hum out loud, then to cover your ears to block out the outside sound, then take your hands off your ears to do that. So let me just give you 15 seconds to do it and I'll hum along with you. Hmm. So if you did that exercise, you'll notice that when you covered your ears, that you sounded louder. And when you took your hands off your ears, you didn't sound as loud. What happened is when you covered your ears, you were just hearing your voice through bone conduction. When you had your ears uncovered, you were experiencing through what we call air conduction. So we actually hear two ways. But because we're generally listening to the air conducted sound in our environment, we're not that aware of the bone conduction. And you'll notice that you sounded much louder with the bone conduction, but actually you would not have been humming any louder. So there's an understanding that the brain does hear through two ways. And we also know that by delivering the listening program with a combination of air conduction through the headphones, as we see here, that that sound travels to the ear and into the brain, but also we uh, have a system that allows for a small vibrator that goes on the top of the headband on the headphones. That vibrator sends the vibration of the music, it travels through the skull, through bone conduction, and also goes to the ear and to the brain. And when these two are combined, what we see is increased stress reduction, an improvement in social engagement, 
um, better vestibular processing because the vestibular portion of the ear is more sensitive to the vibrations coming through the bone conductor than it actually is through air conduction. So it helps us in that first body zone and helps enhance communication because we, as we speak, we are hearing ourselves through bone conduction as well as through air conduction, but we hear through bone conduction first. So it's a way to enhance both that external and internal uh, awareness of sound that we need for communication. So by adding a bone conduction system to the listening protocol, what our providers find is we see a very accelerated rate of response to the program, um, less stress and anxiety, a greater sense of calm, uh, improved social engagement behaviors, uh, vestibular response and communication. So uh, the listening program with level one, um, what you see here is the amplifier which controls the sound and vibration levels. The headphones here which have the little vibrator right here in the headband. Then this system is available either on an iPod with the music on it or it can be used with CDs so it's very flexible. Um, this little amplifier is um, only about two and a half by four and a half inches, about the size of a garage door remote. Uh, so very small and compact and can be put in a pocket. So uh, the child can listen anywhere and really do uh, anything. So what we commonly see with the listening program is a, a range of benefits from improved perception and attention and memory to more motor coordination and language skills listening and auditory processing, uh, improved spatial awareness, more flexibility uh, with situations in life, uh, an increased ability to problem solve and make better decisions, um, very importantly increased self-regulation, uh, sensory processing, the ability to sequence information, to inhibit, to socially engage, to create, learn, um, reduce sound sensitivities, enhanced brain health and well-being. Now with this said, not every listener is going to respond to the program in the same way. We're all unique as individuals and some people will see responses faster, others will see them slower. Um, it depends greatly on diet. Um, so if you're doing a biomedical program, um, the child is going to be much more receptive to uh, the listening process because they're going to be healthier. Um, when they're less stressed, they're going to have um, more response to the program. And you know, if we've got a positive attitude towards it, we're also going to have our, our best ability to respond. Um, a music listening therapy is not something that a parent should have an expectation is going to make their child's life better overnight. Uh, there is an immediacy to it in that the music is beautiful, um, it's enjoyable to listen to, so we get a positive experience which is very critical. Then as we do it over time, the changes will evolve and they'll work. And we would expect most people to have a moderate response uh, that's very measurable and meaningful in that child's life. Some have very dramatic changes, others are more subtle. Um, but what parents need to know is that it's a safe and an effective method, it's non-invasive, it's enjoyable and doesn't require anything of your children other to do something that they enjoy and listen to and, and, and benefit from the music. Uh, the program is made available exclusively through trained providers, so uh, professionals in healthcare and education train with advanced brain technologies to become certified providers of the listening program. And one thing I'd like to share is that Manisha and I have um, spoken and decided to form a research alliance to bring the listening program to more children so that they can achieve their unique and extraordinary potential. So Advanced Brain Technologies, along with the Akil Autism Foundation, are working together to make this program more available to families in India, uh, as well as within the United States. And we are organizing a research, uh, research study 
uh, which will be part of this alliance. So uh, information will be becoming available on this shortly. Uh, I want to thank you all for your time and attention. My uh, hour is up. I've provided my contact information here um, at ABT, uh, as well as my personal email address for any questions. Uh, to learn more about the listening program, you can go to advancedbrain.com. I also have a personal blog where I write on the brain at alexdoman.com. And if you're on Twitter or Facebook, uh, just let me know uh, when you friend or follow me that you were part of this uh, webinar, and I'd uh, happily uh, accept your friendship online. So thank you for your time and attention. And Manisha, I believe now we're going to open this up for questions. don't know if we're having a technical difficulty. I'm waiting for Manisha to come on the line. If you can hear me, Manisha. Oh, I'm already talking. Okay, I, I was unable to hear you. Oh, okay. Did anybody hear me? Um, let me see. I, I think there are questions. Okay. Okay, people want to know uh, what is the protocol for hol hospital holidays from the program? Example, child is two days out of. Uh, I didn't hear the entire question, Manisha. I heard what is the protocol uh, and nothing else. What is the protocol for possible holidays? Okay, so what happens? Manisha, when there are holidays, so there's a standard protocol that's followed, and the provider will work with the family. So when a holiday occurs, uh, we take time off from the program. And then we, when we're finished with the holiday, we return and repeat what we had just done. Then we progress with the protocol. So it depends on how long the holiday was. If it's a couple of days, there may be no modification. If it's one week or two weeks, then there will be a modification uh, made to the program. Okay. I'm going to unmute. Uh, yes, you are unmuted and you can ask a question. Many people are typing in. <laughs> <laughs> Questions open on mic. How do you connect up to two headphones to one unit? Um, two headphones can be connected to one unit uh, using what's called a headphone splitter. Um, so two siblings can listen together, two students together, or parent and child together uh, using a headphone splitter which is available through the provider. Now that can only be done for the program with air conduction only. If we're doing a bone conduction protocol um, because of the need of the bone conduction amplifier, in that case, one person would hear with air and bone conduction, the other person would hear with air conduction only, um, but that is possible as well. Okay. Um, okay. The question. Um, I have the classic program which we have used for a few years. We listen for eight weeks at a time and then take a break. We do it about three times a year. We have not been able 
been back to a provider for a while. And what is the updated system? The level one system is an updated system. Uh, the classic or original TLP kit had eight CDs that were each in the high spectrum category of zone three and also trained zone two but had no zone one stimulation. Um, the music was not high definition and not in surround sound. So the level one system is organized differently in that it has unfiltered music in full spectrum, low frequencies and sensory integration, middle speech frequencies and speech and language, then the high frequencies and high spectrum is in high definition sound, the choice of nature or no nature, and is in surround sound. And essentially everything within the program has become refined. So a family that's done classic for a number of years, uh, moving to level one, uh, we should see an increase in response to the program um, and also all new music, so completely different musical recordings. And if uh, the family's able to do bone conduction, uh, then we'd be that much further along. Manisha, I'm not getting any audio for the past uh, 30 seconds to a minute. Okay, is, is it okay now? Now I can hear you. Okay, I, there's another question. I was a participant in the Tomatis training program in which the facilita facilitators were able to adjust the levels daily. How do the providers adjust the program for individuals? Or uh, is it standard protocol? The Tomatis method and the listening program method are quite different from each other, so it's uh, a bit like comparing apples to oranges. Uh, the listening program requires less individualization. Uh, the Tomatis protocol is often individualized based on a listening test, uh, which is a form of uh, active audiogram on the child that looks at how they're listening changes at certain frequencies over time. Um, the listening program protocol is designed to uh, provide similar benefit regardless of what the listening test would look like. So rather than using a listening test, we look at functional behavioral responses of the child and then modify that protocol if a functional or behavioral response indicates that we need to. I hope that answers the question. He also says, I was a provider when the program first began and did not see significant gains. How has it changed? Um, everything has changed except for the ABC modular design and the protocols. Uh, the early listening program had a single 20-hour protocol. Uh, the research studies uh, that were done initially at University of Sheffield in Great Britain uh, found that two protocols were more effective, so we had moved that classic kit to 40 hours. Now, if we're not seeing the response we want to see to a program, we need to look at each individual case uh, in terms of the listening activities, the listening setting, what else was going on with that listener, um, did we get a complete two cycles in. Uh, sometimes it simply isn't the right time for that person to be engaging in the therapy. Um, you know, Now that the program has been out for over 10 years um, with nearly 5,000 providers working in over 30 countries, we have learned an awful lot. 
So essentially everything in the program has changed over time as we've better learned what doesn't work and what does work. Uh, so the technology is better, the music is better, the equipment that we're delivering it through is enhanced. Uh, so anyone that's been trained as a provider in the past really should be retraining uh, with our company to understand what the program is today because it's quite different than the program from yesterday. Are you there, Manisha? Alex, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, yeah. Um, who, Mike, I've just uh, unmuted. Uh, they can ask a question or they can type a question. can ask a question. I'm going to uh, unmute another parent. Florence, Florence Callender, if you have a mic, you can ask a question. Okay. Uh, how do you com uh, how do you compare your program with others that are based on Tomatis work? Uh, it, it's an interesting uh, question. You know, we've we've been fortunate that our team at ABT has experience with all the other programs. Uh, I think the easiest comparison is this. Uh, the listening program is the method that has original music arranged, recorded, and produced specifically for the method. That is unique to this particular program, and one of the most critical aspects is the quality of the art in the music that's being used. The protocol is one of the easiest protocols to follow. Uh, with as little as 15 minutes to 30 minutes a day, a Tomatis protocol is 80 minutes to two hours a day. Um, the listening program is one of the most portable, uh, the only method with high definition music, the only method with the option of music or music with sounds of nature. It is the only method with the ABC modular design. Uh, for self-regulation. It is the only method with surround sound uh, within it. Um, so it provides a very accessible, uh, easy to use, enjoyable program that also is being extensively studied. Um, for our listeners that are uh, on the webinar, if you visit our website at advancedbrain.com and review the science section, uh, you can see 13 of the studies that have been completed on the program, as well as many uh, of the studies that are currently taking place. Um, but with that said, what I want to say is all music listening therapies that I'm aware of have benefit. Uh, so it's simply a matter of what program feels best for that family and that child and fits their situation. Okay. There are a lot of questions, so I'm going to take uh, um, uh, one. By, I'm going to take one by one. Um, what is included in TLP? You mentioned CDs, iPod training. So when you um, do the listening program, level one kit, you have uh, different equipment options. You can order a CD kit, and that CD kit includes the ten CDs. Uh, that are in a actual wallet to store the CDs and provide a guidebook uh, for the family. So with that, you would get also a pair of headphones, uh, specialized air conduction headphones that would go with it. Um, so that's one system. And then all of the scheduling and forms and information needed. So everything you need to do the program is included with that program. Um, in addition, you can get an iPod that has the program preloaded on it with a pair of headphones. 
And then with either of those systems, the iPod system called iListen or the CD system, you have the option to order the ABT bone conduction audio system, which is the headphones with air and bone conduction and the amplifier, which connects to a portable CD player or iPod. So that's the equipment. And then a provider would provide the, the intake, the scheduling, the oversight, the monitoring, and support of the family using that level one system. And I'll, I'll wait the next question, Manisha. Would be better for a child, bone versus air conduction. Um, whenever possible, we we do bone conduction because it it does accelerate the response and improves the stress and anxiety. However, um, we have not had a bone conduction system all along. Our portable bone conduction system became available in 2007. So prior to that, everyone had done air conduction only. So generally, we want to do bone and air conduction to get a faster result, but the air conduction on its own uh, is just fine if the family's not able to do that. So it, it really is more of a budgetary decision for the family. And I also need to share that there are specialized CDs in the listening program that are available um, to be played through speakers and a protocol that the provider is trained in now. So if a child cannot wear headphones, we have a training program to get them ready to wear the headphones so they can complete in participate in the complete method. So if they're averse to headphones and don't have an experience with it, the provider's able to assist the family in getting the child ready for headphones. The, uh, that they, the, the presentation was very informative. The graphics were very good. Um, I took some notes but wasn't able to get everything. Is all the slide presentation information available online so I can share it with co-workers and use when asking board members for funds to purchase? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Alex. Um, if anyone would like the, um, the slides, uh, I can, they can email me at alex at advancedbrain.com and I will email them a, a PDF file that has the slides on it. Are there some individuals who do not tolerate the protocol? Um, the protocol is modified so that anybody can tolerate the protocol. That's one of the things that works very well with the listening program. Uh, the music's beautiful, and the progression of the program is designed to slowly, to slowly introduce. Um, the, the program so it's easy for people to tolerate. So generally, no, most people uh, can do the pro protocol quite comfortably, but it's simply a matter of introducing it in the right way for them. And that's what part of what makes the provider uh, so important. So if people can't tolerate 30 minutes of listening a day, uh, we do 15 minutes of listening. If they can't listen with 15 minutes through headphones, we'll do some prep preparation listening uh, through speakers to get them ready and then you know if they have a problem with attention for 15 minutes well then we have to find something to help main maintain their attention or help them relax when they're listening such as a deep pressure or massage so um, as families reach out and talk to other families that have done uh, the listening program especially level one with bone conduction they'll find that compliance and success rate is very high and we use this program with extremely sensitive, uh, involved children with a high degree of success. Minimum or maximum age for seeing optimal improvements? Minimum age for headphones uh, quite practically is about age two. Um, 
to where we can get the headphones on a child with a reasonable fit. Um, attention, of course, is a factor, so uh, we need to be doing things for that time frame. Um, and there is no age limit. Uh, the brain is always plastic. The brain is always responsive to stimulation. So whether it's, it's a young child or somebody quite old, I'm aware of the uh, oldest listener that I know of was about 93 years old who was doing the program to improve her listening discrimination skills uh, because she wore hearing aids. And she, in fact, did become a better listener, uh, had better energy, um, felt happier in response to the listening. So it really does work across the lifespan. And then for newborns and young children, we have other music available uh, so that we can actually start programs at birth to enhance the auditory environment and help prevent uh, auditory and other neurological problems with good uh, sound in uh, early in life. So there's a program called Music for Babies. Um, people can see on our website to start a very young or a very sensitive child on before the listening program. Uh, then other program called Sound Health uh, that can also be used uh, across the lifespan. Um, so there, there is more available than just TLP, um, but TLP uh, with headphones, again, minimum age to no maximum in, ter in terms of uh, lifespan. Most commonly, though, it is used with grade school, middle school, and high school children uh, with some sort of identified need. Everybody, I'm trying to take question um, one by one question, so please bear with me if the question has not been answered. Okay. Uh, can anyone buy the TLP and do it at home without a provider? How much does it cost? Um, we do require a provider, so if a family wants to uh, do the listening program, they would need to work with a provider. And Manisha, as I understand it, um, your foundation will um, have providers available uh, in the future in the U.S. as well as in India. Uh, if someone is not connected to a provider, they can always, of course, contact us and we'll help assist them in uh, finding a provider that's right for them yes. uh, in their situation. Yes, we will be providing one in front from New Jersey um, and we will be trying to connect with the different uh, local, uh, different states too. What are yeah, the and, and it is possible for a family to work with a provider not in their immediate area. Uh, so we're fortunate that the program is easily um, overseen um, by a provider working at a distance with a family. So they need not have somebody right there in their community in order to do the program. So I want to make sure that's very clear for everybody. That's not a limitation. What are the major changes you have observed behavior-wise in an autistic child before and after TLP? Well, every child is so different, but the, uh, and in fact, we've been um, working on a book, uh, myself and a researcher named Dorothy Lawrence, specifically on the listening program and autism spectrum disorders. And the, the categories that we see the greatest improvement is in social engagement behaviors, uh, improved eye contact. Um, we see an increased tolerance to multi-sensory stimulation, um, a reduction in hypersensitivity to sound, and in fact a research study is being done at Idaho State University uh, looking specifically at reducing sound sensitivities for children with autism spectrum disorders. Um, ironically, one of the areas we see changes in is potty training. Um, the National Health Service in Great Britain, uh, in Liverpool specifically, has been running a clinical trial uh, using TLP Level 1 with bone conduction to see if it in fact improves toilet training outcomes uh, in children. And uh, so far the early results are quite encouraging. Uh, with that respect. So um, seeing improvements in self-regulation self and self-awareness. Um, reports we see are uh, in better communication 
uh, with children as well. Um, one thing I, I can also encourage the parents listening to do is under the science section of the listeningprogram.com, there is a section on case studies and there is a category on autism spectrum disorders and a number of different cases uh, prepared by providers to show what kind of changes um, can take place and what, and what they look like. Um, you know, obviously our goal is to see a child be happier, um, have a better quality of life, to be able to socially engage with others, um, improvements in eye contact, in facial expression, to see reduced sensitivities to sensory stimulation, and improved emotional regulation. Uh, these are the areas that you know parents are going to be looking for, as well as you know improvements in coordination um, as their vestibular system becomes uh, better integrated as well. Um, but it, as I've mentioned before, uh, each child is very different in terms of uh, their response. But we're you know going to look for positive changes occurring uh, with them. me how does the program compare with other sound therapies as therapeutic listening and Samana sound therapy? Um, I, I did Samana sound therapy as a practitioner for three years at NACD. Um, we clinically studied it. In fact, I worked with over 1,500 children with that program and I think the music uh, in Simonis is very good. Uh, the challenge is there is no um, rationale for programming or protocol. So each practitioner is left to individualize the programs uh, based on their own experience with no real framework for it. So a good practitioner uh, can be quite successful with that method, um, but without a lot of experience it's very difficult. So I would say that Simonis is more challenging to manage than TLP. It was my experience working with Simonis with that many families that helped lead to much of the design of the listening program to make it easier to implement and more effective. Um, but Simonis is quite good. Uh, therapeutic listening um, developed by Sheila Frick uses a combination of different music sources. And again, the uh, practitioner, generally an occupational therapist, is left to you know, kind of guess and troubleshoot in putting their program together without a real strong structure. Um, results are seen with it, but musically um, the program is quite different from uh, what the listening program offers. And I would say by far the experience of the music uh, with the listening program is the best. And if people hear it and, and compare, that becomes very clear. Uh, but a good practitioner can get results with therapeutic listening. Um, the listening program simply define, provides more structure and organization, um, surround sound, uh, the ABC design, as we've spoken to earlier, are all unique uh, to it. Um, and the listening program offers the flexibility to do a number of different exercises. Uh, therapeutic listening is often integrated with a sensory integration program as the listening program can be as well um, to meet the needs of that listener. Yeah, and parents in U.S. Uh, Alex, they want to know the pricing for the entire program. Uh, the pricing for the program uh, varies, first of all, based on the equipment. So the equipment itself for a system of music with headphones on CD, for example, the equipment uh, would start at about $575 for a level one with headphones. Um, if people, that's the base program. If people get the highest end program, which is an Apple Nano iPod that has TLP level one and TLP level one with nature, actually two complete programs on it, so you've got some flexibility with that and the ABT uh, bone conduction audio system, uh, that would be $1,695. So there's about a $1,000 range in the equipment price. Um, 
then the provider will charge service fees uh, for program development and oversight that will range based on that provider's practice, uh, where they work, and how much time they'll spend working with the family. Uh, but ab about a range of 575 to 1695 for the equipment uh, itself. If a family is doing preparatory listening, um, there are individual you know, CDs that we have available that are $16 to about $47 for the preparatory phase if those are needed. Um, but the system that they need to use to do the full protocol uh, is as we've discussed. What is audio yeah. format? In iPod, what is the audio format? Um, we have used a audio format that is a lossless format with no audio compression on our iPod. So we actually took all of our recordings and reformatted them to what's called a lossless standard. Um, on our website, under on advancedbrain.com, under company, there are articles. And under those articles, under the listening program, there is a white paper uh, with the technical information on the iListen system that we've developed that's been written by our sound engineer, Greg Lawrence. So that document will provide more details, um, but it is a lossless format that we use for the iPod, which gives a very high quality sound. Still have questions, Alex, you are fine? I'm fine. Thank you so much. Uh, wondering about interaction between processed audio with special characteristics and, and Lucy compression skips. Uh, I'm not sure I understand uh, the the question as it's worded. Uh, Jason, can uh, Boyd, uh, uh, can you please uh, put the question again? Uh, and Manisha, that may be better for Jason to email that question to me. Okay. Uh, it may be more technical than I can respond. Um, so if he emails me the question at alex at advancedbrain.com, uh, if I'm unable to answer it, I can send it to our audio engineer uh, to provide a response, which we're very happy to do for Jason. Are there any studies of this use in adults with autism spectrum disorders? Uh, there are no studies with adults at this time. Although the program is, you know, used at all ages, um, there are no uh, studies with adults. Different kits as described with pricing on site. I'm conf confused with about relation between Rocky Mountain Miracle Learning and ABT ABT uh, sites. Uh, Rocky Mountain Learning is a website which is owned by a provider in Colorado whose name is Karen Muir. Uh, Karen is a provider of the listening program uh, trained uh, with our company. So she, she makes the program available as other providers do. So the relationship is she is trained as a TLP provider and offers the listening program to her clients. What about the child who cannot tolerate a headphone? Um, as I believe I mentioned earlier, there is a preparation protocol the provider would do with that parent to help the child get ready for the headphones. And the reason they may not want to wear the headphones could be varied. Uh, it could be that they're unfamiliar. It could be that they anticipate or feel they're uncomfortable on the head. So we have to first of all determine why they won't wear the headphones and then we customize a protocol to help them get adjusted to the headphones, which generally involves um, starting with some music through speakers, um, doing some tactile stimulation to um, get the child more comfortable with the headphones to create a very happy um, positive environment for them so and to make wearing the headphones fun and then to gradually introduce them for short time periods one or two minutes 
gradually increasing how long they wear them until we're successful at 15 minutes time. And we're very, very successful in uh, getting helping the children to wear the headphones. And I need to say very importantly that we never force the headphone use. Um, we always want the cooperation of the child, so we're going to meet their needs and their time frame um, until the point in time in which they're ready, uh, which generally you know, can be done within a couple of weeks um, from not being resistant to being comfortable wearing them. My friend keeps closing his ears all the time. Do you think this program can benefit him? Could you repeat the question, Manisha? Friends, my friend keeps closing his ears all the time. Do you think this program can benefit him? Um, by closing the ears, I understand the question to mean the child covers their ears all the time. So generally covering the ears is because the child, one, has a fear of sound, or two, is actually hypersensitive to the sound. And that is one of the areas where the listening program is very effective in reducing the sound sensitivities and the fear of sound. So behaviorally, uh, we see the ears get covered less. And if we have a very successful outcome, the child stops covering their ears and becomes comfortable with the sensory experience of sound in their environment. So the response would be, hopefully they would. Of course, every child's different and we don't know, but that, that's a behavioral sign of a child that is a very good candidate for TLP. Well, will there be any negative effects with this program? Um, negative effects, um, perceived negative effects can happen uh, with any music listening therapy. Um, and they are, they are a sign generally that we need to modify the program. Um, we have seen no long-term uh, negative effects on listeners, only transient behavioral changes that are generally coupled with good improvements. So what we can see uh, with some kids, if they're getting overstimulated, which means we probably need to modify their protocol, is they might get more agitated uh, for, for a time being. Um, we can see a little change in mood and behaviors. Uh, occasionally, some kids will increase sensory play, um, but that will actually get better uh, in time. And if a child is hypersensitive to sound, uh, they may get a bit more sensitive to those sounds for a while until their br brain learns how to modulate that auditory input. So, but uh, in the same notion, these changes are a sign of a neurological change taking place and are generally coupled with improvements uh, in other areas. So we look at uh, each situation case by case and make a modification. Um, but parents can feel very comfortable that this is safe um, and, and effective and isn't going to harm their child. Uh, but there can be some short-term transient uh, behavioral changes that take place. And the program will be modified accordingly if needed to be. Uh, and I can take another question, Manisha. If you happen to be speaking, Manisha, I'm not getting any audio right now. Okay, sorry. Um, is it okay now? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, I want to know, what, will, will there be a different price range for the professionals and the parents back in India and, and in U.S.? Will there be any different price range? Well, in terms, you know, right now the, you know, programs internationally are based on a U.S. price. Um, then, then that price is converted to local currency. 
Um, I believe uh, that Akil Autism Foundation has some interest in uh, helping uh, families with more economic need that may be in India, um, but that's still to be determined, correct, Manisha? Uh, we are look. We have uh, an occupational therapist uh, in Bangalore, and uh, we will be uh, coming up with a research uh, with with her. So I will be uh, communicating with Alex and her in shortly. But thank you everybody uh, for all the for attending the webinar, Alex. Thank you so much for all your time. And, oh, it was uh, a, my pleasure, Manisha, and I I appreciate everybody uh, in the audience and all the wonderful questions. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Okay. So in case anybody have questions about the webinar, uh, please email me, director at akilautismfoundation.org, or you can directly email uh, Alex, and hopefully we will uh, see you all uh, with, with every uh, webinar. Um, Alex, I'd like you to just wait for a few minutes. Uh, I will just like to introduce you to our uh, occupational therapist in Bangalore. She is online. If you have time, or we can do it again. No, I, I'm happy to uh, to wait, Manisha. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, everybody, and. Uh, doesn't have a mic so I am going to um, take her questions and ask ask you okay <laughs> so you no can problem. Ask, yeah you can ask a uh, ask question uh, Vishali if you are uh, if you are there you can type in your question Okay, I think she has emailed me the question. So, what is Alex? I'm going to email email you forward you that email, and then maybe okay. I'll arrange. I will arrange one more, uh, you know, her webinar just for uh, for you and her. Um, yeah, just have her put all her questions together, and then we could do this or do a Skype call or something. Exactly. Exactly. That be that would be fine. Um, Manisha, are you are you pleased with how it went? It went very well and it was very informative and um, I definitely want to look into the bone conduction for for Akhil because just uh, I have the classic program and just with the yeah. classic program I see so much as a children he's aware that he's talking and he's aware he's using his words. So yeah. I definitely um, good. Yeah, and we definitely look forward to doing more research for India and uh, and US. Oh, me too. So we'll we'll follow up. Is uh, you know I'll take the questions as they come, and why don't we regroup after the holidays? Okay. Sure. Okay. We Are you there? Keep in touch. Yeah, I'm there. Okay. Thank I'm you, there. Manisha. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.